Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to discuss a different aspect of my 2004 Dodge Viper and some of the things I've learned about living with it, specifically what it's like to live with a convertible. Now I've said in previous videos that I am not a convertible person and the only reason I bought a convertible is that this generation of Viper was only sold as a convertible. So what that means is for the car that I wanted that was still within my price point, I really did not have a choice. Some of these might come off as a little bit Viper specific, but I'll try to keep this a little more generic so that way if you're just considering a convertible, convertible in general and you happen to stumble upon this video, hopefully it'll still be a little bit more applicable to you. So with that, let's get into it. <laughs> Now the first and somewhat obvious thing is being a convertible, being no top, there is a lot of wind. And I mean a lot of wind, but this affects your ability to hear anything. It affects your ability to hear the radio. If you have a passenger that you're trying to talk to, it affects your ability to hear them. If you have GPS directions, you can't hear that. And if you're someone like me who likes to create content and then put it on the internet for some reason, it's extremely difficult to do that in a convertible because there's no good place for you to put the microphone and get decent audio. I have hours of footage, literally hours of footage where I tested out different camera angles and different audio positions where I put the mic in different parts of the car. If you put the mic on you, if you put it up behind the windshield, if you put it way down by the base at the end of the dashboard, doesn't matter. It still picks up wind noise and it doesn't really get a good audio of you. It doesn't get a good audio of the exhaust note or anything. Even with the convertible top up, there's still enough wind noise that gets through that anything that you're going to say really gets washed out. That was a cop and he ain't going for me, so we're good. But even just from a daily drivability standpoint, it's loud, it's not going to be that quiet luxury experience if that's what you're looking for. The second is that the wind is unsurprisingly going to ruin your hair. Now, the reason I mention this, even though it's obvious, is it's not that it's just going to ruin your hair, which you kind of expect and you kind of know that, it's also going to fling around your passenger's hair or any other hair that's in the vehicle. So for example, if you have any dog hair or cat hair that's on your clothes and you don't want it to get into the car, it will blow all around your vehicle and you will find it somewhere in your car later on. I guess it doesn't really stop there. I guess you could say anything in the car will get blown away. So if you have any like papers that you have sitting in the passenger seat, any documents, pretty much anything that you have that is not weighed down within the cabin of the car is just fair game to go flying into the atmosphere. Or as we all know, girlfriends love to mark their territory by twining their hair through all of our clothes, specifically our sweatshirts. So that way we are marked in the event that we go out into the world without them. One of the times I was testing camera angles, one of these intertwined hairs was in my sweatshirt somewhere here around the collar. And all I felt for about 10, 15 minutes of the ride is this thing bouncing up and like pinging off of my neck in the side of my face. And it was really obnoxious and I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. So I have a solid five to 10 minutes of footage of me just doing this, trying to get this thing off of me. But beyond that, if the hair is still attached to your girlfriend's head, it is still going to get blown around, which, you know, kind of seems obvious, but what you'll quickly find is that even though maybe you're willing to deal with some of those sacrifices of living with a convertible, the person that you're driving might not be so open to living with those sacrifices. Just because you're okay with it, it, they might not be and that might have been a discussion that I had to have with someone that didn't exactly go in my favor. More or less what I'm getting at is if there's any other passengers that you have who will regularly be in this car, make sure that they're also okay with it because they might hate that wind, they might hate the fact that it's not quiet, and if it's something that they will have to routinely live with, it's probably worth taking that in as a consideration. So just keep that in mind is if you have someone who's going to be routinely riding in this car with you and they are very much not a fan of it, that could be a point of contention. Now for me, this is my dream car and I was like, you know, come hell or high water, this is going to be in my garage at some point. This person knew this was coming for years to come and even though they're not crazy about it, I told them, you know, we just don't have to ride in it, we can just take your car places, that's not a huge deal. Next should also be obvious is that you can't really ride a convertible through the winter. Specifically, you can't ride a soft top through the winter, at least in the northern states. Biggest reason being is that these soft tops 
are prone to tearing. Now, if you have a hard top, you can generally treat it like a coupe and you can get away with it a little bit easier. But especially if you have a soft top, just trying to brush the snow or the ice or whatever off your car, especially if it's frozen on there, the level of force that it takes will slowly abrade the soft top over time. And as I showed in one of the first videos I have of the car where I went through all the problems, these soft tops and all soft tops are prone to wearing through in places of high abrasion. And they are not inexpensive to replace. So getting a new top on mine just in parts was a couple thousand dollars to have someone actually replace it. I think I got quoted something like $4,000. And I have like a spot that's abraded through that's, you know, two or three inches long. Not a huge deal. I can deal with it. But especially if you're the type of person who wants everything on the car to be immaculate all the time, definitely will not be able to ride it through winter and cannot abrade it in any way. Now, those ones that I already started with, those are some of the more obvious ones. So now let's move on to the less obvious ones that I wasn't necessarily expecting as much. The first point is level of exposure to your environment. Now, I have a motorcycle riding background, as I've said in a number of videos. When you're on a motorcycle, you are very aware of the outside temperature because that temperature air is pressing up against all of your body the entire time that you are operating the vehicle. You have a little more seclusion in a convertible, but even with the soft top up, it is just not as well insulated, kind of like I said for the sound, so it does get a little bit chilly at times. There are days that still look sunny outside that you're like, oh, you would think are good convertible weather, but I still almost always keep a sweatshirt in the trunk because I have figured out that it gets a lot colder, a lot faster than you think it will. And that's especially true as the sun is going down, you know, especially early summer and late fall. Now the Viper specifically, the exhaust is ungodly hot and you do obviously have heat and AC in the car. And even with the top down, I'm actually really surprised at how well the heat and AC work at keeping, you know, your base core at a reasonable temperature. I didn't think that with the top down, you would actually do anything appreciable, but it does. But building on that point is because you usually have that wind exposure, you usually feel a few degrees colder than it actually is. So even when it's warm, you don't necessarily realize that you are being roasted alive by the sun. But I definitely made that mistake one of the first weeks I had the car. I was cruising around on, a, it was probably like a mid high 70 degree day. Perfect weather for it. I was not cold, I was not hot, but I was just having a good time. Then at the end of the day, I looked in the mirror and I looked like an absolute lobster. I also figured out shortly after that all those Harley riders that you see wearing the bandana, it's to protect their bald heads from the sun. I never knew that before this. So if you have a hat, probably a good idea to wear one. In retrospect, would not have been a bad idea and probably would have saved my face. Continuing on the trend of environmental exposure is that you don't have a degree of separation that you're really used to. So things that you see on a routine basis that you you don't necessarily process as being a threat or of a concern in any way, suddenly become a concern because you're in a convertible. There's a lot of things that fall into this category. So normal road grime is among it, like sand, gravel, or even if there's like an oil spill or something. If there's a vehicle traveling in front of you that is kicking up any of this stuff, if you're normally in an enclosed vehicle, you don't normally think about the fact that a rock could bounce off of your forehead because why would you? It's not going to, you have a roof. But especially in a car like the Viper, where you have a very low window line and I am relatively tall. If I sit up like this and I crane my neck, I can see over that roof bar. Now in my normal driving position where I'm not trying to make myself into a giraffe, that's not the case, but if something hooks just right, it can hit me in the head. Now I've experienced this on a motorcycle where I've had a pebble bounce off of my helmet. It does not feel good, especially at highway speeds. Now the Viper, I never contemplated that being a problem until a rock or a little pebble went over just barely missed my head and landed somewhere in the passenger area next to me. Other things that are a problem are people throwing trash out of their window. I have had that issue on motorcycles as well. Now I have the prospect of it landing in my passenger area. That's really frustrating. But I think the far bigger issue is people smoking cigarettes. So not only just people ashing out the window and having that ash fly into the interior that I just cleaned, but also the people who feel the need to throw lit cigarettes out into the road with a convertible behind them. How does that not cross your mind as a concern that you're throwing a lit fiery object into an open vehicle. But then again, you know, if a couple hundred thousand cancer deaths per year caused strictly by the product you're consuming aren't a concern, why would the life of someone nearby be a concern? Just blows my 
fucking mine! Oh, my neighbors probably heard that. I think my biggest frustration is people at this point. Just the distinct lack of awareness absolutely blows my mind, although I wish I could say that I was surprised and that I thought people had the level of intelligence and self-awareness to be conscientious of things like that. But we all know that they don't. But moving on, the other thing to be aware of from other vehicles is that if they run their windshield wipers, those will also blast you. Doesn't matter if you're two or three car lengths back, you will still get blasted by the windshield wiper spray going over the top of the car and not only down the front of yours, but pelting you in the forehead, especially if you're a taller driver. And I wish I could say the problem stops there, but this same thing happens if you use your own windshield wipers. And not only if you're using them while driving, but even if you use them at a stop sign. So I use mine at a traffic light, totally sprayed myself in the face, totally got a sweet taste of windshield wiper fluid. It was not the most pleasant thing I've had, but also probably not top five of the worst things I've had. That's probably a few stories for a different day, but it does make it difficult because if your windscreen gets blasted by bugs, which they tend to, you just kind of have to deal with it and the lack of visibility and the fact that it looks like absolute trash and it's blocking most of your field of view until you're able to come to a stop or a gas station and then scrape them off at that point. But out of habit, you will inevitably forget and you will be giving yourself a shower at least that's been my experience up to this point. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not the worst thing that can happen because bugs can also just get in the car. Like uh, mosquitoes, flies, spiders, spiders. Do you know how bad it is when you lower your visor to undo the latch for the top and a spider drops down and is like four inches from your face? I've been in some terrifying situations in a vehicle, mostly as a result of my own driving. A spider being four inches from my face is probably among the worst. And a bee flew into the cockpit once, but then also there wasn't quite enough wind to get it out from being down by the dashboard. It kind of had like a little eddy of air and was just like circling this one spot. But I also personally might be allergic to bees, especially considering how genetics work and other family members being allergic. And that's not something that I want to find out while driving a 500 horsepower car with no traction control. Hey guys, editing Zach here real quick. Can you just imagine for a sec that I did get killed by a bee sting while driving this car? We had to explain that to people. Like you tell people like, oh, he died driving the Viper and everyone assumes I've crashed the car in some fiery accident. Like, no, he just, he got stung by a bee and then pulled over softly and then choked on his own esophagus. Probably the worst and most anticlimactic way to go out in a Viper. Anyway, thought that was absolutely ridiculous had to share that back to the video so far that is my experience with driving a convertible and again i'm not really a convertible person i didn't really expect or look into any of these things ahead of time but pretty much what all of this boils down to is there is just a lot more environmental exposure whether or not you have the top up. Obviously, there's the other ones too of like if you get caught in the rain, you got to worry about putting the top up and stuff like that. So plan accordingly. That's that's what it comes down to. Don't go blasting through the rain with the top down or if it looks cloudy, put the top up early before you get wet. Seems pretty obvious to me, but it's the internet, so one of you is gonna screw that up. But there you have it. Those are some of the quirks that I figured out of living with a convertible that I had not necessarily thought of and some things that you should consider if you do want to buy a convertible. But anyway, that is all I've got for this episode. I've got the car out of storage now. I've got summertime coming. Hopefully I'll be able to do more in-car videos for you guys soon. But thank you guys for watching and I will see you next time.